Hey guys, welcome to Capturing Christianity. My name is Cameron Bertuzzi, and today I'm here with Trent Horn, and we're talking about his story from Protestantism to Catholicism and his uh, his conversion. Would you call it a conversion? Oh yeah. I, well, I would say not just from Protestantism to Catholicism, but I guess you could call it deism okay. to Catholicism, really. Okay. So were you ever you sort of, well deism? I'm thinking of like you know you think that there's some kind of creator. Maybe right. they're not omnibenevolent or anything, but were you ever agnostic or atheist or no, did you I, always think that there was a God? I would say that I, you know, so I was raised in a nominally religious household. Uh, so my dad is Jewish. My mom is a Protestant who is a former Catholic. So what's funny is she tried to enroll me in the local Catholic school because I was the best school around. And the nuns at the time said that they wouldn't take me as a student because my mom had left the church and, you know, she's going to contradict what they're teaching. Why would they try to teach me at their Catholic school if I have no chance to grow up to be a good Catholic? So, you know, I, I showed the nuns wrong. And so that was, that's always, that's always fun. But, um, so we didn't, we didn't go to church though. We didn't go to church on Sundays. We had Christmas and Hanukkah. And after that, it was kind of, you know, choose whatever you want to believe. Mm -hmm. And so growing up as a kid, I had always believed there was a God who was kind of out there. And that didn't seem to be a strange notion to me. Even going into junior high and high school, that made sense to me that somebody struck the cue ball and got the universe going. But it was a very mysterious kind of first cause. Then as a little kid, like I watched uh, Bible stories. I still show them to my kids. They're the, uh, the Hanna-Barbera greatest, greatest adventure ever told. Uh, they are the best Bible story in my opinion. What, what is, is this a YouTube video? You, they were originally on, v, I mean, I watched them on VHS tapes. Now you can get them. They were made, Hanna-Barbera made like You're the Jetsons. Yourself. They made, totally, they made the Jetsons and the Flintstones. Okay. And so the same people that made the Jetsons and the Flintstones made Bible cartoons. And they're done really well. Hmm. And they've got really good celebrity voice talent, like Ed Asner, the old man from Up, plays Joshua. And like, you know, all these great elements in there. And so I watched it as a kid and I, like the Bible stories. Then when I get into high school, I ask my parents, where's the evidence this stuff ever even happened? And no evidence is presented. So I just kind of, I just dump all that. And at the same time, I got really into dunking on Christians for believing in young earth creationism. And so I, I lumped all of Christianity into a kind of an anti-science, uh, anti-historical framework. I thought it was just a crutch, basically. You know, it's, uh, I liked science. Uh, I was, when I was 10 years old, I was in the Young Astronomers Club, you know, so I was, ooh, I, I, uh, you know, <laughs> we, we did a field trip to Jet Propulsion Laboratories. I saw the big Cassini spacecraft getting built. And so I believed in a God that made everything, but I didn't think there was any religion I'd be a part of. Mm -hmm. uh, then that changed, though, when I was midway through high school. I was getting a, a, a English paper graded in my English class, and... Uh, a group of students came in, some I knew, some I didn't, and they were part of a Catholic youth group. Uh, it was called Life Teen. And so they were having just their lunchtime meeting. They had free pizza. I figured I would stick around. And I went to a few of these meetings, and they would have the food, and then they would have a conversation. Like, they do a little talk and then take questions on God or Jesus. And I thought, wow, this is, it's interesting. They're willing to take my hard questions. And so I, I appreciated that. And then more and more I looked into it, and then uh, someone invited me to go to Mass, and I wasn't sure exactly what that was. And so they talked about it being the holy sacrifice of the Mass, and I said, if you're going to kill a goat up there on the altar, I'm probably going to check out right now. It's not, you know, because I didn't know anything about this, really. How old were you? Um, 16. Okay. Probably, so it was like half, six, about halfway through high school. And this encouraged me to give Christianity a second look. And so what I did, this would have been in the early 2000s, like 2000, 2001, and uh, 2002. So during that time, I uh, read books. I went online to try to find as many atheist Christian debates that I could find. So this was before YouTube. So this was just like finding any MP3 that I could download on a 56K modem. Uh-huh. 
And so, though I did find, and a lot of them were the, the William Lane Craig debates. The old school. The old ones. The old school, 1990s. Which are still really good. Oh, they're super good. Yeah. And so when I would watch that, or I would, and honestly, the writers and thinkers that helped me to come to understand Christianity were primarily Protestant. Uh, so people like William Lane Craig, J.P. Moreland, uh, some of the work of Josh McDowell. Uh, and so that kind of got my feet into the door, though there were other people like the writings of Peter Kraft. Mm -hmm. that I really enjoyed. but And that was interesting. One of the first apologetic books that I bought doing my research was the Handbook of Christian Apologetics. It was originally published by InterVarsity Press. Is that by Kreeft? Yes, it's by Peter Kreeft and Father uh, Ronald Ticelli. And so I didn't really know it was a Catholic, they were Catholic authors, like when I first bought it. Uh -huh. And it is essentially, it's a defense of mere Christian theism. And I, I was just really hooked, and especially listening to the debates and the arguments, seeing, wow, the Christians have really good reasons to believe in a, a robust view of God, and also to believe that God revealed himself in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And so I just remember one night, I was just praying, and it all kind of clicked, and I said, you know, Jesus, I believe in you. You're, you're real. You know, you know I, I believe in you. And I remember having my hands up even when I prayed that, and it all just kind of clicked for me. But then I had, I was just at a, at a crossroads. It's like, now what do I do? Do I keep going to the Catholic church my friends had invited me to? Or what about the other Protestant churches that I had gone and visited? What's funny is that I actually enjoy going to some of the Catholic churches because I'm a painful introvert and Catholics <laughs> are notoriously bad at welcoming people. Like you'll go to some Protestant churches and suddenly there's like eight greeters that surround you <laughs> and want to invite you to everything. That's and I'm, so funny. And I'm like the kind of person who's like, oh, please don't talk to me. Yeah. I, I, I'm uncomfortable by all of this feigned attention you're giving me. I know it's not authentic right now. Whereas with, with going to a Catholic church, like here's your worship aid. Now you can see in the back. I'm like, I could get used to this. <laughs> I like that it's, it's just business here. Though, I mean, uh, though I have been to smaller Catholic parishes where it does feel more familiar, and Catholics could definitely work on that. But for me, I I like that. But still, it was mysterious. It was like this sacred mystery I respected, but didn't totally understand. I'm like, what is what's going on with all of this? And so I was thinking, okay, where do I where do I go from here? And so I thought, okay, well, why don't I'll, I'll just read the Bible and just try to figure it out for myself, or try to read the very first Christians to see what they believed. And I think, though, in my journey, I noticed something that I think that uh, people have to consider now, especially Protestants, because I think there's a resurgence in Protestants looking at especially Eastern Orthodoxy mm -hmm. and Catholicism. And it's this idea about uh, the default position and, and the burden of proof. So I think sometimes, like, you and I might feel a little bit frustrated if an atheist treats atheism like it's just the default I don't have to think about. I'm going to start with atheism, and if you can't convince me of theism, then I'm going to be an atheist. I, I can just start here. And then you and I would say, well, no, you can't really start there. Mm -hmm. You should just start with, I don't know if there's a God or not. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of agnostic about the whole thing. Maybe atheism, maybe theism. You can't start there. You should start in a more neutral position. And I think that's something that we have to do also once we come to believe in mere Christianity, which for me, I, I just came to believe God exists. Uh, Jesus had divine authority and he vindicated that authority by rising from the dead. But then from there, it's like this default position, you kind of look off. You, do you remember the end of the movie uh, Castaway? Did you ever see Castaway? Oh, yeah. That's one of my favorite movies. Yeah, even though they spoiled the ending in the trailer. They show him getting rescued. I'm like, what are you doing? You show him getting rescued in the trailer. But like at the end of it, he's trying to find the lady to deliver the package, and he's standing at like the crossroads. Mm -hmm. And she's like, you go this way, it goes here. You go this way, it goes there. I really believe that mere Christianity is, is that central point a lot of people get to, where it's like, yeah, I believe in God, and I believe Jesus is God, and he rose from the dead. But then I feel like there's kind of like three options you can go to from there. It's do I believe in my authority is scripture, 66 books of the Bible that are fully inspired and are inerrant, which are additional beliefs to just God and Jesus, right? Those are additional beliefs we're, we're, we're jumping onto. 
Or do I go to scripture and a sacred tradition that guides us, which would be kind of like Eastern Orthodoxy? Or do I go to sacred scripture, sacred tradition, and a magisterium, a teaching office, universal one, which would be in Catholicism? And that was kind of the place where where I was at, though I didn't put as much thought into it like that as I do now. Yeah. But I'm I'm not concerned, but I think for a lot of people... You were nevertheless at a crossroad in your life. So I I think that, especially for Protestants who are thinking about, well, what, what should I believe? I would just encourage, don't treat Protestantism as if it were just some kind of default position. Mm-hmm. It's just, well, obviously, if I believe in Jesus, I'm just going to be, I'll be Protestant. And then can Catholicism or Orthodoxy defend their claims? And if they can't, I'll stick with Protestantism. I don't believe that that is a licit move. I think that, I mean, why couldn't you just be someone who says, yeah, I believe Jesus rose from the dead and God exists. Everything else, though, there's these other ancient documents and I just live my life based on what Jesus tried to tell me to do. I feel like a lot of people just kind of make, and I don't want to make it contentious or anything. It's like, oh, I, I, I've i adopted mere Christian theism, mm-hmm. like Protestantism like automatically follows, but I don't think it does. There's more things we have to like logically get through to get to that point. And that's what I had to do when I believed in Jesus, but it's like, okay, is, is it Protestantism or is there some kind of apostolic succession that I have to look for? Mm-hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, in, in my my case is a lot different because I didn't start out like a, as a deist or as an mm. agnostic. I started out in a Protestant tradition, very charismatic tradition. Mm. So that's where that's like my background. <laughs> I, Not say, just that. Well, what's well, <laughs> yes, I'm sure even more. Well, what's funny is that I am being the painful introvert that I am. I have been to charismatic worship services, and and I do enjoy them, but I. I always, sometimes I always don't feel like I belong. I always like give names to things like the high five, the dual high five, the bowl, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> so, okay, so you, so for you is more like a default because that's what you knew. It's what well, you that's what, yeah, that's what I've grown up in. Sure. And yeah, so yeah. there's, yeah, there's, there's tradition that I've got to, to grapple with and other experiences that I've had at Protestant churches. So, so there's, I mean, there, there's, there's more to it. I think that you've, you've got a good point if someone is coming to this with no prior background and no prior experiences, I think that's right. That if you become convinced that mere Christianity is true, that God exists, that you know Jesus is God and, and uh, Jesus rose from the dead, I think at that point it does make sense to, to say, look, there's you're at a crossroad here. Like, which way are you going to go? And there, there are three options. There's like three legitimate options. And, and obviously within uh, each of these, there's, there's still wiggle room in each sure. one. Right, and Protestantism probably more wiggle room than the other two. Protestantism very, very, very much. Eastern Orthodoxy maybe a little bit um, because there are the Assyrian churches of the East, which are even older than Eastern Orthodoxy. They broke off in the the fifth century, though uh, among Eastern Orthodox, the, the divisions tend to be more um, ethnic or or national. It's like are you Greek Orthodox, are you Russian Orthodox, uh, things like that. And then you have Catholicism, much more truncated in mm-hmm. any differences uh, there. And the differences there are, are usually just differences in worship. Like I attend an Eastern Catholic church, for example. Isn't that what, what Matt? He was. He, he was attending one. I think I went to it. Yes. Yeah, so so Matt was attending a Byzantine Rite Catholic church. So when we say Catholic church, we should say Catholic churches, uh, that there are these uh, autonomous churches preserving the deposit of faith, though they are all united by uh, their union with the Pope and the bishops. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I tell people, yeah, I love, you go to my Eastern Byzantine church that continues the liturgy of Constantinople, you'll feel like you're in an Eastern Orthodox church. It just has a picture of the Pope in the vestibule. Uh, You know, so, so I do believe that, especially if, and that's where I was, it's like, okay, well, which way, which way should I go? Yeah. And I think sometimes in order to understand that, it's like, well, try to look at it for, I would say, it's always hard to remove our preconceptions. Like whenever we read scripture, we don't realize how many preconceptions we bring to it. I think that's right. It's like the passage in the book of Revelation where Jesus says of the churches like in Laodicea and Colossae, uh, you're neither hot nor cold, you are lukewarm, so I shall spit you out of my mouth. And we take that to mean, well, Cameron, you can't just be lukewarm about Jesus. You know, Jesus would rather have you be on fire for the faith or totally cold to him. The thing he hates the most is being lukewarm. That makes no sense at all. 
Like Jesus, like he wants me to, he would rather have me hate him than be lukewarm towards him. And actually then when you actually uh, read the passage more in its, its historical context, the hot and cold referred to the temperature of water that fed two very spiritually healthy communities. I think it's in um, Hierapolis and Colossiae. So like in that passage, like one of the communities that was very spiritually vibrant had its own hot springs, and the other one had naturally cold water running in from the mountains. Uh, and these were both spiritually vibrant communities. And I, I want to say it was Laodicea. I haven't read the passage in a while. The one that had the lukewarm water that was uh, that had to come in through an aquifer. So it becomes, and it's also carbonated, so it's kind of bitter. Uh, you drink it, you're like, oh, gross. And that was kind of a symbol of how spiritually malformed uh, that community actually was. Hmm. And so it's interesting, like if you didn't, when we with our, you know, 2,000 years later when we read stuff, and that's just one little example. Culturally removed. You're so far removed. And so that's why, it's it's difficult then when we when we read scripture, especially when we try to read uh, things like the dispute about f- when Paul talks about faith and works, for example. That's why one thing that was uh, has been helpful for me in my spiritual development is reading the works of the New Perspective on Paul, or you could call it the New Perspectives on Paul. So these would be people like James Dunn, E. P. Sanders who, these are Protestant authors who say, no, Protestants since Luther and Calvin, they read Paul's, uh, in his dialectic with the Judaizers, and they read the debate between Catholics and Protestants in the 16th century back into this dispute, and they get it wrong. This idea that Jews never believed that you had to do a certain number of works to get into heaven, for example. No Jew would think that. Rather, Jews believe that you came into the covenant by grace because you're born a Jew. God picks if you're a Jew or not. And so rather, the dispute is not about doing enough works to get into heaven. The dispute is about whether being a part of Jewish identity is what matters most for being a part of the covenant community. And so, um, but but back to my, I guess, to, in my conversion, I, I tried to look at scripture and the early church. Yeah, I, I wanted to mention, because I want to yeah. come back to it, yes, the, yeah. the, the question that you were asking about, like, you know, default positions and yes. from mere Christianity, where do you go from there? I do have some thoughts on that, but I want to hear your story and how you, yes. so, where you went from there. So I just go and i uh, looking and reading through, and it's interesting to see, like, I look at just starting with the Gospels. I'm like, okay, what does Jesus want from me and from other people? Is it for scripture to be my highest authority and that's what I follow and and intend to implement? Or is there some kind of specific church that endures over time I'm supposed to be a part of? And I find it interesting, Jesus' continual references to a single church, yet Jesus never tells anyone to write prior to his ascension into heaven. He never even tells anybody to write anything down, ever. Uh, Then going forward to see with the apostles, I see a focus on uh, laying hands on others. Like nobody is able to become a pastor of their own initiative. I mean, it's like today, it's like, how do you become a pastor? You kind of hang up a sign and if people come to your church, <laughs> good for you, <laughs> you know, or may- maybe you'll go to seminary, you know. Uh, but that's not what I was seeing in, in the New Testament or, or in the early church. And especially when you get to people like St. Ignatius of Antioch, as I was reading through like, wow, this is so different from a Protestant framework that I had been, that I had been used to with Protestant friends seeing like what St. Ignatius of Antioch was talking about, about a single uh, bishop following him, like how Jesus Christ follows the Father. Uh, so to me, it, it all, it made sense in looking, in, it, looking in, these, in these different directions to see how faith and authority and continuing authority had been, had been revealed. Hmm. So it's, it sounds to me like you, you almost got to Catholicism from uh, reading your Bible. Would yeah. You, well, yes, uh, and so when I would read through, I thought there were a lot of passages. There were some doctrines that stuck out to me more clearly than others at first, and so that made certain Protestant beliefs uh, no longer live options. So like going through the Bible, it seemed very clear to me that uh, Jesus taught things like baptismal regeneration, the possibility of salvation could be lost, um, a very high view of the Eucharist, if not the real presence, for example. And so even just right there reading through, I'm like, okay, but some Protestant denominations, that would be, I I can't believe that. Others, maybe I could like Lutheranism, 
for mm. example, would start to be more more appealing there. But then I, the the more fundamental authority framework of what authority do I look to? Uh, why would I, you know, the old problem of the canon, you know, why do I believe in these books and, and not other books? Uh, and for me, I think a lot of it was just, I just want to read the first Christians and just figure out what, what did they believe? What, what did they act like? So that involved reading things like the Didache, Ignatius, Justin Martyr. And you and it was were, fascinating. You, were you reading these church fathers? Like in this, you were still trying to figure out, you know, where you wanted to to yes. go at this point, so you were still investigating. Yeah, and so I would read that, though I think something like orthodoxy or Catholicism was starting to make a lot more sense in just seeing the um, the preservation of the faith over time Okay. in this way. Uh, and then, though, uh, then after that, so reading those sources and then kind of like what I did with atheism and Christianity, it's like, okay, I read atheist books, you know, uh, was it Michael Martin had atheists, Philosophical Justifications of Atheism. That was one of the first ones. Or George Smith, case, The Case Against God. I remember that. That was probably written back in the 70s of, of these atheist books. Because, I mean, I, I was doing this before the God Delusion came out, obviously. This was before the new atheists really hit their stride. So I was reading the, the old atheist stuff. <laughs> and so the, much the same. Then I would read, what do Protestants have to say about Catholics on these issues? And to me, going through that, sola scriptura seemed untenable that there wasn't a biblical or a historical justification for it. So I felt like, no, there is a church. And that's interesting in scripture, actually. Like when you read, you never read about someone going to his church or starting a church. There's always the church in Rome, the church in Ephesus. It's always, uh, Jesus tells people, uh, if you have a dispute with your brother, Take two, you know, go to him, two to three witnesses. Last resort, go to the church. After that, he's like a tax collector to you. It seemed to be a very uniform and, and enduring thing. And that was the thing that I wanted to find. And then I think, though, that especially like the papacy, that I think is probably like one of the key differences between Catholicism and Orthodoxy, provided this kind of uniformity, especially seeing the early church, to keep the whole church together. And for me especially, like that made sense. I know this is more of an intuitive argument, but it's kind of like I remember in the office when uh, Michael and Jim are co-managers. Co Do you remember that episode? Oh, yeah. The office? yeah. Yeah. So it was like a whole uh, season, I think. Yeah, it was a whole arc where Michael and Jim are going to be co-managers of the office. Mm -hmm. And Oscar is like, well, of course, you know, what, what country doesn't yeah. have two presidents? <laughs> Where would Catholicism be without the popes? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and it hits on something that even among earthly institutions, even among human institutions, we naturally kind of create a pyramid-like structure of leadership to provide unity and continuity over time. You have a CEO, you have a president, you have a prime minister, you have a supreme allied commander of the army or of armed forces or a general. Or Jesus. Uh, <laughs> right. Well, then, but then also, you're right. So someone might say, well, then for the church, Trent, you have Jesus. Yeah. You have Jesus being the head. Uh, but when what I saw, though, that if Jesus establishes a church, it's kind of like how God establishes the kingdom of Israel. So you might say, well, who's the king of Israel? Well, God is the king of Israel. And David is the king of Israel. So is it both? Well, yes, ultimately God is going to be king of all. Much like how with Israel you would have the king or you would have like the prime minister who oversees. And so that's why there's many Catholics will point to a parallel in Matthew 16 about Jesus giving the keys to Peter being similar to the keys that are given to the what was essentially the role of the prime minister of, of Israel, the regent that oversaw the kingdom in Isaiah 22, for example. So I, I found that to be fascinating. Okay, uh, let's return now to the, uh, the the crossroad and how, you know, someone who is, yes. uh, accepts mere Christianity, yeah. uh, just the, the, the core tenets, you know, let's say God exists and Jesus is God and Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, let's just stick with those three for now. Yeah. And then where do you go from there? Do you, can you just jump straight to Protestantism or, you know, it, it, are all three on par? I think that's a really interesting question. And, and as we've been doing this interview, I've been like thinking about it the whole time. It's yeah, let, but mind. let's, because we always start, because think about it, why do we believe the Bible's the word of God? I mean, 99 times out of 100, isn't it because somebody else told us? It's a, one of our parents, it was our pastor. It was, you know, an apologist we saw on YouTube. Uh, and and we, we accept that tradition. I mean, traditions just, the Latin word tradere comes from the Greek word paradosis, that which is handed on. 
So in a sense, scripture is a kind of tradition. It's just what's handed on to people. Mm -hmm. So for me, like, like, why couldn't you just be this? You could just be, I believe Jesus rose from the dead. And so I just do whatever Jesus says. There are all, like, like you could say, there's all these ancient documents. Like you could, and that's what I did kind of in my journey. I'm like, look, you've got the canonical gospels, gospel of Thomas, gospel of Peter, gospel of Philip. You've got New Testament letters. You've got other early writings, first Clement, the Didache, uh, the fragments of Papias. Uh, so you, like, you might like, not just a Bible, but what if you just had like this whole collection of everything that talks about Christianity. Let's even throw Josephus in there, why not? And it's just all there in the first century. Now what do I do? What if I just said, well, I believe Jesus is God, so I'll just be a red letter Christian. I'll, everything Jesus said, that's what I need. That's all I need. And there's people like that, mm -hmm. you know. Then there's other people, the disp hyper dispensationalists, who say the only Jesus was only for the Jews of his time. We only have to follow Paul, right now. So that would be in Protestantism, hyper dispensationalism. Well, where 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 do you where do you bridge where do you bridge the divide? So I guess like for me, when I look at all of it, where does Jesus give his authority? To me, he gives it to the apostles, like that is where he wanted people to look. He talks about them sitting on thrones, judging Israel. Uh, that is where the authority lies. Like he never mentions anybody writing anything. So then you move from like the time prior to Pentecost to after. And then it's like, well, what, what do we see in the church? We still see a very apostolic church where the apostles lay hands on others to be elders, to be overseers deacons, we won't call them priests, bishops, deacon, whatever word you want to use. And we see the we see the growth of a church more. And to me, I'm like, well, does that church, does it still exist today? And I think some people might say, well, yeah, it's all it's it's everyone who's baptized. The church exists, it's all of us who are Christians. But for me, I'm like, well, it's not a very helpful church. It's like, can I go to this church for doctrinal guidance or for uh, to help uh, with some kind of disciplinary matter. It seems like if the church is just everybody who is Christian, cool, but, but I can, there's not really much I can get there because it's very contradictory in its existence. You, you see how that would be frustrating, kind of? You mean Protestant, like the different I mean, denominations? Every, I mean, everybody. It's like, what is, like, I, I, when I was reading scripture, I'm like, there is a church, Jesus established the church, John 17, praying for believers to be one. And the big question I had in my in my journey when I'm looking at Protestantism, Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, where is that church? Does it still exist today? Because mm -hmm. some people, like the Mormons, for example, will say it died, and it was restored in 1830 by Joseph Smith. You could now that you could believe it or not. I don't believe that, and mm -hmm. that's a whole different conversation. But it's an interesting view. Others might say, well, no, it still exists. It has continued. Where is its historical continuity, and and what is it? And it, it, is it an enduring, visible, hierarchical structure? Like hierarchy just means sacred order, hierosarchos. I would believe if Jesus made a church, it would have a sacred order to it. Um, but my point is, I think a lot of people might say to me, the church is just Trent and Cameron and mm -hmm. everyone else who was a saved, baptized, mm -hmm. saved, baptized, whichever word you want to use. But to me, I think you can look to the church more for just, hey, we all happen to be Christian. You can receive spiritual nourishment, guidance unto salvation. The church should lead you to Jesus, should lead you to salvation. That's why St. Cyprian in the third century said, uh, one cannot have God as father if he does not have church as mother. But I think today for a lot of us, especially in the Protestant world, the church is not what leads me to salvation. Uh, the church reinforces the path to salvation that I biblically discerned, so to speak. I don't know if so that makes sense. Would you say at, at this point you're like giving reasons to favor or privilege the Catholic path to take that one? At this point, are you mean in my journey or what I'm saying right what now? What you're saying right now, not not necessarily in your journey, but just in, in general. Because we were we were at this uh this crossroad, you know, and, and mm -hmm. so it seems like you've been giving some reasons to the church and uh, yes. to, so, to go so, this so, route. So my reasons would be like if I'm at the crossroads and I just believe Jesus rose from the dead, and I'm looking where did Jesus's authority go after his resurrection? The, the authority that, that I listen to as a believer to guide me in my life. I would say there, I cannot make the logical steps to get to Sola Scriptura and the 66 book canon of the, the Protestant Bible. I don't see 
how one can make those jumps. And I think many arguments, I remember I was reading a Protestant apologist defending Sola Scriptura, uh, and his argument for the truth of Sola Scriptura was based on the idea that it would be fitting for God to give us his revelation uh, in this way. Do you remember who it was? Yes, uh, actually, and I don't want to paraphrase it incorrectly. It was in the book Scripture Alone by James White. Okay. Now, I don't know if that now, hi, James. We'll, <laughs> I'll talk to you about it on the dividing line later. Uh, you know, uh, I'm going to show him up on the dividing line. I don't know, which I have appeared on there for every now and then. Oh, I have uh, recently. I have too. Oh, hey, there you go. Com common ground with yeah. our Catholics and Protestants. Yep. Um, Can't say I, anything I would, about and, Catholicism without James White having some comments on it. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so it's uh, it's interesting there, though, even... Um, I find James, though, to be an interesting evidence for Catholicism sometimes, in that James, as be being a, a Calvinist, would, would hold to the view that human beings do not contribute to their salvation. You know, he, he rejects what would be called synergism. It's not like you do your part and God does his part. God is sovereign. God is the one who saves mm -hmm. alone. Uh, but if you are a Protestant who says, well, no, uh, I can contribute to my salvation without earning my salvation. You know, there's many Arminian or non-Calvinist Protestants that would tell James White, no, 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 I can contribute to my salvation without earning it. Uh, then I think when one adopts that attitude, that can help to diffuse objections to Catholicism, thinking that Catholics earn their way to uh, salvation. When it's like, well, no, you see the merit that we, when we do something and cooperate with God, that's not the same as earning a place before God. We just disagree about what is it that God wants us to do to cooperate with him. Because I actually, I think like to understand, like how does a Catholic get to heaven? You just get baptized and you don't commit a mortal sin. That's it. And if you do commit a mortal sin, you, you get reconciled with God. And I think a lot of Protestants feel the same way, honestly. Like, how do you get to heaven? Well, you, especially if you believe salvation can be lost, it's you get saved and you don't forsake your salvation. And if you do, you reconcile with God. I think it's a really similar path. We just disagree about what it is that God obliges us to do in our, in our Christian walk. So I think we can have some of that commonality there. I like looking for commonalities. I think that's really important. And, and in fact, Ben Watkins is in the room and I'm about to have a conversation with him about <laughs> some of the things that atheists and Christians can agree on. Yeah. But so I, I want to get this before we uh, end out the interview. And I feel like I could talk to you forever. Yeah. But I wanted to say this about here's here's one thing that I've been thinking about that might favor the Protestant route as we're at that crossroads. Sure. OK. Yes. Um, so let me say this as a caveat before I get to that reason is that when we're thinking about the definition, if you want to call it the definition of Protestantism, mm -hmm. seems like we'd have to take into consideration what are like the essentials of Protestantism? Because you mentioned Sola Scriptura. I don't think that's essential. My, I, I, would, I would think that is like an accidental. Do, do you think Protestantism is different than mere Christianity? I would say I'd have to think about it more. But I think that my, my initial... Uh, intuition is yes there there are some differences i just don't know what they are i'd have to probably like for example would you say someone who says i believe jesus is god i don't believe the bible is inspired mm -hmm. but i believe the bible historically shows jesus rose from the dead and so i do what those if it, if there's a record of what jesus said i follow it uh -huh. do you, i mean do you think that person would be a protestant I'd honestly just have to think about it. Because, sure. I mean, that's a question that I was like kind of raising yeah. for myself was like, what are the essential, I don't, I don't know what the essential properties are of Protestantism. Is a, pro a Protestant is just someone who lacks belief in Catholicism or Eastern <laughs> Orthodoxy. So one doesn't have a burden of proof. See that you see the parallel I made earlier about atheism. It's well, like, <clears throat> so what I was going to get at, and let, yeah. me, let me say this. Sure, sure. And, and that's why it raised the question of, of the essentials of Protestantism. Yeah. Is that for Protestantism, it does seem, on the face of it, that it's a more modest view mm -hmm. in the sense that it has sort of less assumptions. But sure. then, while I was thinking about that, I was thinking, but hold on a second, if Sola Scriptura is part of Protestantism, mm -hmm. that is an additional thing that right. Catholicism doesn't have. Mm -hmm. And so then the question is, well, which view actually is more modest? And so, but let's just talk about camp out on modesty. And yes. would you say that if, 
So that, take that conditional claim. If Protestantism is more modest, then that's at least one reason to prefer Protestantism at the crossroads. Uh, it may be provided that the modesty doesn't come at the cost of the elegance of the explanation. And so I would make a parallel once again to say to you, does, uh, is naturalism would appear more modest than theism to many naturalists, would that be an argument? That's essentially what the philosopher Paul Draper argues as to why one ought to prefer naturalism to theism. It's intrinsically more probable uh, because it is more modest than what it proposes. Mm -hmm. It only proposes the physical world. Theism proposes the physical and the mental. Ben has perked up. He's like looking, he's looking over, over. He's, he's like, like, well, he's like thought about that. looking so, <laughs> so fondly. And, and so someone Trump. could say, well, Protestantism <laughs> proposes the written word of God and Catholicism yeah. has the written and unwritten word. It's so you might, although you might rejoin her and say, ah, yes, but the naturalist though, his modesty comes at the elegance and it raises more problems uh, then it seeks to answer. And so, so while initially it may be appealing, I will just say just initially naturalism may be more appealing, uh, proposing more entities, if the theory becomes more, the worldview is more elegant overall to explain everything, I think is better. So maybe I should write something, but I, I really see a lot of these these parallels here. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, uh, I think I've got a good response to this. Okay, and that is, sure. that is to say that like, we need to focus in on the conditional claim that I was making. So the conditional is, mm -hmm. if Protestantism is more modest, this conditional, right? We're not saying that it is more modest, but if it is, mm -hmm. that's at least one reason to, to favor it. It doesn't mean that it's like a decisive reason, sure. you know, couldn't be overcome by some other kind of thing. So that I think that would be con consistent with what you were saying is that, you know, maybe in the end, Roman Catholicism would be more elegant or would be a better, you mm -hmm. know, r route in the end. Nevertheless, modesty could be at least one consideration in favor of Protestantism in the same way, bringing it back to the naturalism question mm -hmm. that, you know, if, because I'm, I'm still like, I'm not convinced that naturalism is, is simpler than theism. Right. So, but, but you I can, could possibly I could agree with their conditional. I could believe that and mm -hmm. say that, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure which one is more simple, but I could at least agree with the conditional that if, if naturalism. naturalism were more simple or more modest, mm -hmm. then that would be one, sure. one reason, not a decisive reason, sure. just one consideration in favor of that. And I, could, and I could be open to that view of myself towards Protestantism. Okay. That if it were more If modest. it were more uh, Yeah, and that's, that's, the que that's why I was like, what are the essentials of Protestantism? But then, we, but then we have to figure out... And what is it more... How does it... You know, how could you have a more modest... Because I would say that that might apply more to this fourth option that gets overlooked, which is just non-Protestant, mere Christian theism. And one only... Say belief. that again? Non-Protestant, mere Christian theism just believing the proposition God exists and Jesus rose from the dead. Uh huh. Cause I, I feel like that would still be Protestant. Like I, my, my thought is like non-denominational, someone who's like believes that, I don't know. Imagine you show up to your non-denominational church and you say, well, I don't think Hebrews is scripture because I don't even know who wrote it. How's that gonna fare at a non-denominational Bible study? I think it would probably go over, it depends on the church, <laughs> depends on the sure. number. Cause some, some, you know, progressive churches would have probably no, no problem with that at all. Mm -hmm. So I think it would probably just depend on. Right, and, and, then it, it, and then of course there are some Christian churches that are so diluted, they're practically indistinguishable from atheism. Uh, in that God just becomes our hopes and dreams that we believe in, uh -huh. and we have faith in faith. So, I, and I would say, like, um, like for example, like, like Unitarian Universalism. We just believe in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Like, is that Protestantism? See, really, on the, it's really on the I boundary just, for me. I just don't know yeah. what the essentials are. It it it, it just have to open up another. Well, question I, guess, of, I guess for me, like the, the classical Catholicism essentials, seems more. Like it, it's more obvious what the essentials are, and right? Because well, it seems to me that the the core essentials for Protestantism for 500 years were sola scriptura and sola fide. Mm -hmm. Now you have Protestant authors who are critical both of sola scriptura, saying that well maybe this is not a justifiable position. I think was it Craig Allert wrote a book called A High View of Scripture? Question mark where they're questioning inerrancy, inspiration, sola scriptura, sufficiency, even on uh, sola fide. Um, there was a book, I forget the author, he was a Protestant author, but he wrote a book called Salvation by Allegiance Alone. And so he was saying that what Jesus and Paul means by faith 
is more not the modern concept of faith, but the modern concept of allegiance would be a better term for us to understand there. And so really transforming what we mean by sola fide. So I, I think you're right for us to, like if we try to determine, like if you're at the mere Christian theism crossroads mm -hmm. and it's like, where do I go from here? Protestantism, orthodoxy, Catholicism. I think a lot of us have our heads wrapped around, well, what orthodoxy entails, though that can get a little fuzzy. Catholicism, at least you have a universal catechism you can go to. Like, when you ask me, what do Catholics believe? Here's the 1994 catechism. Yeah. Enjoy all 2,700 paragraphs. <laughs> With Protestantism, though, because the field is so wide, even now when we're trying to discuss, like, are you What are the essentials? Yeah, are, are Unitarians a part of it? Is it half, like, normally you would think sola scriptura, sola fide. But I think even you might say, well, there's progressive Protestants that don't really believe in those. Mm -hmm. I think they did a poll recently, like 40% of Protestants didn't believe in sola scriptura. You know, so it's like... It doesn't surprise me if that's true. Right. Uh, so, uh, and Catholics, we have our own problems, of course, with the, the rank right. and file getting getting the, the beliefs right. But at least with Catholicism, like you'll have like 70% of people who say they're Catholic don't believe Jesus is present in the Eucharist. Now, that's people that might show up to church once a year on Easter with grandma, you know. But at least I can say, well, they're wrong because the catechism says this. But with Protestantism, it's like, well... The Unitarians are wrong. They're not Protestants because, hmm, well, what does make somebody a Protestant? That's a big question to, I think before one embraces that label, one must be able to say this is what it means. Now, some people will go further. They'll say, I'm not just a Protestant. I'm a Calvinist. I'm a Lutheran. I'm mm -hmm. a Baptist. And they'll say, this is what we believe. Here's the justifications for it. And I think that that's, that that's good. But then along with that, don't take a given, I would say. Don't take like, you know, the Bible is these six, it is these 66 books. It is fully inspired, it is fully inerrant. Well, where, where is the evidence for that? Because for me, here's what I find interesting. It'd be a separate kind of... It is. It should not be taken as a given. Uh, because here, here's what I find fascinating. Some Protestants will tell me, I can't believe in the papacy if, Trent, if the only thing you can give me on it is Matthew 16 and John 21. You know, or, you know, you've got these four Bible verses. If that's the best you can do for something as central as the papacy, I can't invest in that being the foundation of my belief system. But then I would say, well, then what are the biblical verses for the foundation of your belief system? So it's like, what are the Bible verses for sola scriptura? That, that's an inconsistency I see sometimes in that the Catholic can't present enough evidence for his foundations but the Protestant foundations are almost like a presupposition or a given. Well, I, I can, think that's I, problematic. Yeah, I can see how, as someone who, you know, you interact with atheists a lot, I can mm -hmm. see how someone who interacts with atheists, you, the, some of the same moves are kind of being made by by Protestants, yes. I think. So, and I, I'm very sensitive to that because I, I deal with atheists a lot too. So right. I, I don't want to make the same bad moves that are being made on the other side. So, yeah, so I, I would just say, let us... <laughs> Isaiah 1, 1, 8, uh, or 118, I'm, I'm always really dyslexic with Bible verses. I, when I get them wrong, it's just because I switch the numbers. So you ever hear me in a talk, usually I, I switch the numbers around. Uh, I'll just quote it like Jesus would. The scroll of Isaiah says, come, let us reason together. So, I mean, that's what I think you and I have to do is say, okay, what's nice is you and I have bedrock, like God exists, Jesus rose from the dead. Yeah. Like we are, like the, the evidence to me is, is very, very strong for that. And then I would just say the additional claims that are put forward, whether it's the, Bi the Bible is inspired and inerrant, inspired and inerrant, and our sole infallible authority, or sacred tradition or magisterium, these other claims, let us see what is the evidence for each of these claims, and let us not follow the chain past where the evidence gets us. Because a wise man proportions his belief to the evidence. I guess. So uh, <laughs> to close out this interview, what is one thing that you would tell someone like me who, I mean, I, I do have a few reasons. We, we won't get into those today, but sure. maybe at some point. Another time, another, maybe. Another time we'll get into some of those. Yeah. But someone like me who, I mean, I would like to be a Catholic. I think that there are certain things about Catholicism. Yeah, why? Well, I, I, I would just like to be, I, I feel like uh, it'd be a cool group to be a part of. It, I've, I've also, I mean, there's so many beautiful things about- We have about, some snazzy theistic philosophers to hang out with. You also have like Franciscan churches and I could like maybe wear a robe one time. 
Oh yeah. No, you can talk to the animals. Churches, the churches, the churches are beautiful. A lot of yeah. them um, in America, some of them are not as as beautiful as like in Europe and stuff. But yeah. no, still, there's a lot of beautiful Catholic churches in in America as well. Yeah, but it's but not, yeah. It, it's not just that. I mean, I, I also find the mass really beautiful. I find the Eucharist really beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, there was there was something else, but th there's there's a lot of re it, confession. I, I find that really really beautiful. Mm -hmm. the, the just the the process of, of confession and uh, you know a lot of these things just don't exist in, in Protestantism nevertheless there's a few things that are sort of keeping me back sure but as as someone j just so, the question is to wrap it up what would, what would my advice be what would be yeah your advice to someone like me who you know and, and you can answer it either way because you don't know what my reasons are at this point in in the conversation but what would you? What would your advice be to someone who is considering Catholicism that sort of wants it to be true? What would you? Yeah. What would be your advice to them? I would say uh, the advice that I would give you would probably parallel the advice you would give an atheist who wants God to exist. Like, what have you met an atheist who said, "I really, I really wish God existed. I think Christianity is beautiful." I, I, see, I think that's actually Ben's. Yeah, Ben's view. Yeah, so there. Let's see what happens. When... I'm trying not to say anything. <laughs> so let's say uh, that's why next time we have to have a conversation with the three of us. Um, like, what would you say to someone like that? And I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but I imagine you might say something like, "Why don't you try living as if it were true? And if you find something beautiful about Christianity, just enjoy it for its its own sake. And if it gives and if it gives you fulfillment." Uh, just try living as if it were true. And uh, you don't have to be fully mentally committed because that's very hard to will our own beliefs. But it's like say an atheist, if you like say, if you enjoy when you go out to Yosemite saying thank you to someone who's made it, who created all of that, just say it. Even if it conflicts with other parts of your worldview about the problem of evil or things like that. You're like how do I remedy the beauty of Yosemite with the ugliness of the Holocaust? Just say Yosemite's beautiful. We'll figure out the Holocaust later and thank God for Yosemite or wherever. Uh, and just find the things that are beautiful in Christianity and just enjoy them and let it fill up your soul and just enjoy that because life's short. Enjoy the beauty of it and, and those good things with it. And then from there, slowly try to work through the parts that are more difficult. And so there, I would make the parallel with the Protestant and Catholicism. If you find the mass to be beautiful, go. Go and enjoy. And, and and just pray, pray the prayers that are, like when I was in my conversion, mm -hmm. there were some like Marian prayers I didn't pray because I was spooked by it. Yeah, no, no. When I, when I would gone pray with, the prayers that <clears throat> felt good to me. Yeah, when I've, when I've gone with Matt, I've, I think once or twice. Yeah. Uh, but when I went with him, there was definitely some stuff that I, w I had like no issue, you know, yeah. praying back or whatever. And just enjoy, enjoy yeah. that. And, and really, uh, yeah, I would say just kind of rest in it, enjoy it, fill up your soul with it. And then when you feel invigorated by that, look at some of the challenges, though I do believe then at some point where you are on the fence, if one is on the fence, uh, then one could apply a kind of Pascal's wager, the same you would between naturalism and theism. That you might say to an atheist, if you really want it to be true and you're just right on the fence, ah, just, just give it a try. There's a, there's a 30 day money back anyways, you know, return <laughs> policy, just give it a try. Just go ahead I'm, and you know, I'm gonna believe it even if I'm not fully there, because it couldn't hurt. You know, and so Pascal's wager is not about avoiding hell. Pascal's wager is just, hey, if you're already on the fence, the costs of being a Christian, you don't sleep in on Sundays, you know, they're offset by the gains of Christianity. And I would say if you're a Protestant who is just like crypto Catholic, and I know Protestants who s sneak off to mass and don't tell people, <laughs> you know, it's like, hey, the, the costs that are involved, uh, especially if you're a Protestant who believes Catholics are saved, not damned, you know, they're, that they're Christians, the costs are going to be minimal, maybe awkwardness of friends and family. The benefits will be, be much greater. So I would just say, once again, the parallel, I'd have a horn's wager on mm -hmm. Protestantism and Catholicism. Like, you have very little cost involved, but, but, but much to gain if you're on the fence there. And right. also, in becoming Catholic, you don't have to give up Protestant stuff. It's not like I'm saying, stop reading the Bible. Yeah. You can still be, like, honestly, that's why I kind of love hanging out with Protestants, because Protestants are good at you know, they can actually cite scripture versus chapter and verse. You know, we could talk about a lot of these, these interesting issues that Catholics don't, but in, a Protestant who becomes a Catholic, you don't really have to give up stuff that you loved as a Protestant. You love studying scripture, you love Bible study, you love evangelism. 
it's like the St. Paul Street evangelization people I know of, they, they're very Protestant at heart. So I feel like there, the cost is little, you're not really give, you're not giving it up what you loved before, but you're gaining even more things you can love now. All right, I think that's going to do it for us. We've, <laughs> we've gone a little bit over time. That was fun. But yeah, fun. no, I feel like we could talk for another three hours. We'll I have under, to talk I, again. I understand why your, your, uh, your chats with Matt go for like five hours. <laughs> It's ridiculous. Yeah, well, he, Australians, it just rolls off the tongue, you know. It yeah. It just keeps going. But was, yeah, it was, it was a real treat, Cameron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for coming on. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys in the next video.